everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Zag Zay Push from the Botanical Garden today. So we're looking at the domestic policies of Truman, Ike, and Kennedy. While we're looking at the domestic, we are going to get a sense of that Cold War ideology as the undertone. So sit back, relax, and let's jump right into this. First, we will look at Harry Truman. Remember, Truman was FDR's vice president and came to office as a result of FDR's death on April, uh, in April of 1945. Truman out, finished out FDR's fourth term and wins re-election in 1948. He's going to assume power at a difficult time. The fears of the Great Depression returning after World War II and the growing fears of the Soviet Union and a communist revolution are all going to influence the Truman domestic agenda. One of the most important pieces of legislation of Truman and possibly the 20th century was the GI Bill. The bill would provide funding for colleges as well as mortgages for homes. This bill was geared to help the assimilation of returning veterans back into civilian life. Moreover, the mortgage loans would influence the rise of suburbanization as these soldiers would buy the cookie cutter homes that Levin and Sons were building in the New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania area. Furthermore, this would help solidify Long Island, as our piece of local history here, as the first suburb of America. While many enjoyed the suburbanization and subsequent baby boom, suburbanization did have a negative impact on African Americans and other minority groups as we see de facto segregation in these areas. These communities did not allow African Americans to purchase homes, and the city saw the white flight to the suburbs. While suburbanization limited the rights of African Americans, the Truman administration did take steps, however, in the growing civil rights movement. Truman reorganized the military, which included Central Command, given the, newly, um, uh, given the new name of Department of Defense, from the Department of War. This, you know, a little less violent. The CIA is formed, and by 1948, a year after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in baseball, Truman, by executive order, desegregated the military. So the military was, desegre uh, was segregated uh, up until 1948, where we're going to see this desegregation. While the consumer production taking over wartime production, we are going to see that the war pact between labor and industry is now over. So now we're looking into labor. We're looking into the, the labor institutions that are happening and the labor issues that are happening. The late 1940s and into the 1950s are going to see a series of strikes, and the union ideology will also um, reflect the undercurrent of the Cold War. Remember, People feel unions as it could pose, people fear unions as it could pose a threat to American capitalism. These union workers could, in some minds, be the basis of a communist revolution here in the States. Truman, who was pro labor, but we also see some instances where um, that's going to be deviated from, especially with the fact that he understands that industry needs to run America, that industry needs to go grow, especially during this time period immediately following the Second World War. And he also feels that the, the government itself does have a right to interfere with the labor unions when it, feels, when it sees that it's necessary, especially if it's going to hurt national security or hurt the American people. The Truman administration does see a weakening in the labor unions with the Taft-Hartley Act, which, which Truman ends up vetoing, but he was overridden by the two-thirds majority in Congress. This act outlawed the closed shop. This act outlawed the closed shop. You also had to conduct loyalty oath, oaths to the country that were mandated. Again, Cold War fears. Under this law, the president can issue as well an 80-day cooling off period and seek an injunction in any industry if a federal court determines the strike is a national emergency that imperils the national health and safety. So if the president feels that he um, needs to jump in because it's going to hurt the American people, they claim that right. While the Republican majority held Congress did weaken the labor unions, Truman's domestic agenda did reflect and expand off of FDR's New Deal. Truman's Fair Deal, as it was called, would cement FDR's New Deal policies into the American vernacular. The Fair Deal would increase social programs that the New Deal began, solidifying the United States as a limited welfare state. The Fair Deal increased minimum wage, extended Social Security. All Americans love Social Security. It's going to be a basis of the American um, 
political, social, and economic ethos moving forward. Allocated money for urban housing. Remember, the cities are changing as a result of suburbanization, and the plan continued the public works projects um, of the time period. So we're going to see more flood control infrastructure projects under Truman. So he's taking this new deal. He's He's, he's still a Democrat. He's still part of the FDR, New Deal Democrats, but he's um, as well as expanding this. So we see him living on the legacy of FDR. With Truman not running in 1952, the 22nd Amendment was ratified in 1951, but Truman was still eligible to run um, due to the fact that he was the incumbent and it was passed during his, um, during his time during his uh, presidency, excuse me, the United States is going to see the war hero now, Dwight Eisenhower, become president. Ike, as he was called, will use his reputation as well as, a, as, well as television to help him, help him win the election. He had 55% of the popular votes and 442 to 89 in the electoral votes. Furthermore, his vice president, Richard Nixon, would do, all, would do all the heavy campaigning for Ike. And yes, there was scandal during this time period, too, um, with the checker speech that you could look up because we're trying to make this a little bit quicker than the last video. Ike wins the election and the Republican Party actually cracks the solid South. Now we're going to look at ike's domestic policy if you want to know more about ike's or truman before or kennedy after his foreign policy make sure you look uh, look back on that last video that we did um, on the foreign policy so here we're concentrating on domestic but again like truman ike's foreign po uh, domestic policy is going to reflect that of his foreign policy um eisenhower was the first republican since hoover the role of government and the nation as a whole had dramatically changed since the conservative era of the 1920s so there's some questions that Ike needs that the Americans need to think about. How Ike was going to handle this new role of government? Would he look to roll back FDR policies and have a similar ideology of the conservative three of the 1920s, or would he use the FDR New Deal as new FDR's New Deal as safety nets in his new form of republicanism? The modern republicanism would not look to undo, and this is what we're going to see with Ike, it's going to be called the new republicanism. That's going to be his domestic agenda. The modern republicanism would not look to undo the welfare state that was created by FDR. Remember, we're that limited welfare state where the government is stepping in. Rather, he would look to curb it. Ike was a moderate on social issues, and, ex and also he was a moderate on social issues and a fiscal conservative. So he was a very moderate president, and that's, um, you could see that with when he was going to run for president. The Democrats and Republicans were basically fighting for um, for him to run for their party because he was he was falling in line with the moderation there. Um, Ike was a moderate on social issues and accepted the New Deal policies as part of the new modern America. In actuality, he expanded some New Deal programs like Social Security. He raised the minimum wage and expanded urban housing. While the Interstate Highway Act of 1956 was not part of FDR's New Deal, it did, however, reflect New Deal policy and New Deal ideology. So Eisenhower was going to create this massive infrastructure project of the interstate highway system. The act added 42,000 miles of interstate highway, linking the nation's major cities together. To do so, a massive public works project was undertaken that would use tax dollars to build and employ thousands. This we see as, you know, we could compare this with the WPA, the CCC, and the TVA during the FDR administration, putting young men to work, building infrastructure projects to unite the country and, and, and bring the country together as a whole economically, and the byproduct of that will be socially. The impact of the highway would forever transform America. The U.S. became an automobile culture. Trucking would also become a major factor for shipping goods across the nation, although that would hurt the railroads and we would see an increase in air pollution. In addition, the interstate highway would fuel, pun intended, suburbanization, but would also have a backlash as mass transit was largely looked past, thus having a negative impact on many of the urban poor as well as other minority groups. Ike would also look to balance the budget during his time in office and curb the United States. So this going back to his ideology of curbing the New Deal, um, but curbing the New Deal and war deficit spending. 
We're going to see now the question of civil rights with Eisenhower. And again, Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier in 47. Truman desegregates the army in 48. So now we're going into the civil rights era of American history. Eisenhower would also see the expansion of civil rights and why some thought he was soft on civil rights. In actuality, he was more of a moderate, which reflects many of his domestic policies. However, during his time, the U.S. would see Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, which would overturn the 1896 uh, Plessy v. Ferguson decision of separate but equal. And we're going to see this come to effect with the Little Rock Nine, um, where Eisenhower is going to protect the nine students in um, in Little Rock Central School District and in, in, in going to school. He's going to send, I believe it was the 82nd Airborne, to protect, and in, to protect those students going in for an equal education, as well as enforcing the Supreme Court's law, the Supreme Court's decision. With the expansion of some civil rights, we do see a reduction of civil liberties, most notably towards Latin Americans as well as Native Americans. And we're going to see what was called, and this is a terrible name and, and just, a degre, uh, just a disgusting name, but what we see is Operation Wetback, which was um, the mass um, dealing with uh, the masses of illegal immigrants coming into the United States in the 1950s. And the biggest fear for this, that why they're going to um, deport these these many migrant workers coming into the United States was the fear of the job market. Again, the 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 fear of slipping back into that Great Depression and and taking away jobs that that uh, Americans would already have um, was one of the fears. And we're going to see the migrant workers, most notably in the Southwest, uh, where we still see today in in a lot of the agribusiness. Um, we're also going to see with the issues of Native Americans the termination of tribal status. So. Eisenhower, or excuse me, FDR during his New Deal, he's also going to have the Indian New Deal, which basically repeals the Dawes Act, which allows American Indians to practice um, to practice their tribal communities and tribal living on the reservations. And then what we're going to see, which was a big victory for American Indians, but what we're going to see is during the uh, Eisenhower administration, that's going to be rolled back. That's going to be rolled back because if you think about it, American Indian the, the, the social structure of it is no, there's no land ownership. There is no um, home ownership. Everybody's living in, 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 as a community together. And there's no, um, there's no land deeds. There's no documentation. There's no monetary system. So this is starting to look a lot like communism in the minds of those, what we're going to know, uh, call what I like to call is the cold war blinders on, on America, where it, this fear that, um, you know, this is going to be resembling too close to communism. Um, so this, again, with the fears of the Cold War, the Eisenhower administration um, is going to, the D Eisenhower domestic policy is going to be of that reflective of the foreign policy. We're also going to see a lot of change with the teenage culture during the time period. Um, with the fears of the Cold War, the Eisenhower administration saw a changing teenage culture at home. Rock and roll became all the craze, and teens were adapting to the new car culture and suburban living. In addition, the consumer culture expanded with new technologies such as the, tele as the television became a um, central figure in, in, in one's living room. And you had all the, the, the Leave it to Beavers and the um, and, uh, uh, Father Knows Best, those types of shows that were showing American Puritan, not Puritanism, but the purity of the American family, the nuclear family, as um, as a way of expressing our political ideology through this Cold War. And as a result, you're going to have TV commercials. So now new businesses, um, tobacco companies, uh, advertising, or excuse me, companies of, of, you know, appliances, whatever the case may be, are going to use now television to advertise. Um the suburbanization and subsequent baby boom that started during the Truman administration continued through the Eisenhower administration. The cookie cutter homes, as previously said, of Levittown, as well as the traditional gender roles, were all reflective of these. Were also reflective of these Cold War fears. Social conformity would become a phrase to describe the suburbanization of the era. With the Red Scare raging through, including in pop culture with movies such as The Blob or Invasion of the Body Snatchers, social conformists did not want to stand out as being submersive, subversive. Excuse me. 
However, there was backlash to the social conformist, the, the social conformist as well. The 1950s saw the rise of the beat generation, or beatniks as they were called. The beatniks rejected the notion of the notions of consumerism, as well as the growing religious movement of the era. Remember, the growing religious movement was to refute the communists who had a state-mandated atheism. This is when we start to see God in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, as well as uh, in God we trust on all of our coins. Writers like Jack Kerouac, who wrote On the Road in 1957, and poet Allen Ginsberg, who wrote Howl in 56, would represent the pushback against social conformities. In addition, beatniks promoted psychedelic drugs and overall rebellion against the social standards. These intellectuals would be the basis of the hippie movement that we're going to see come the 1960s as part of the counterculture. Ike would leave the presidency with parting words that would reflect the warning, of the f warning to future leaders. Ike discussed in his farewell address the importance of not becoming a militaristic state. He warned against the military-industrial complex or the relationship between private defense industries and contracts, which bring a lot of money, and how they should be in check to not influence our foreign policy. For anyone else, this would make Ike look soft on communism as well as weak militarily. But remember... He was the Allied commander during the uh, Second World War, so he saw the horrors of war. He knows what he's talking about. He could be trusted in this sense, people would think. Moreover, his military-industrial complex notion reflects George Kennan, our friend Mr. X, assertion to not be more Soviet than the Soviet. By the United States ramping up military production, it could have a negative impact as a militaristic state. Like, where could we go? Could we go to the... Could we, if, if this is all ramping up, could we go as far as being part of those totalitarian regimes? We will see this warning ignored during the disaster, disasters of Vietnam, where the U.S. thought they could win by fire, firepower alone. But more on that later. With Eisenhower retired, the 1960 election saw Republican and former VP Richard Nixon go up against John Kennedy as a young, charismatic senator from Massachusetts. Once again, we see TV playing a major role in the election as well as solidifying the technological technology in elections to follow. This election saw the first televised debate between Kennedy and Nixon. And for those that saw it on TV, they felt Kennedy won as Nixon was tired looking and drawn down from a cold that he was fighting. For those that heard it on the radio, they felt Nixon, is, Nixon had won. In the, end, in the end, the election would go in favor of the Democrat Kennedy. Not to worry, folks, though, we will see Nixon again soon. Kennedy's domestic policy, so Kennedy would be in office roughly a thousand days before his assassination. Kennedy's domestic policy would reflect a call to action from the American people. John Kennedy's inaugural address inspired children and adults to see the importance of civic education and or civic action and public service. His historic words, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, challenged every American con to contribute in some way to the public good. Kennedy practiced what he preached. His new frontier, as it was called, would look to expand civil rights, aid to education, federal support in health care, and as well as urban renewal. While Kennedy did not, uh, did not see many of these ideas come to fruition, they would be the basis of Kennedy's successor, Lyndon Johnson, in his great society. So what we saw here is, the is, and this is quick, and I apologize if I was going too fast, we saw the three Truman, Eisenhower and Kennedy. We saw their domestic policies here up close. Um, so, again, this was domestic policy. Previous video was for foreign policy. So that's it for right now. We'll see you in the next week with, v uh, with the Civil Rights Movement and the Vietnam War. So stay tuned for that. Be well. Be safe. Strive for the five. Have a great day.